kick it off. So hi, my name is Samantha Hewitt. I am a senior growth marketing manager here at Telgorithm. Welcome to our live Q&A on 10 DLC compliance. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to be discussing all things 10 DLC compliance and campaign rejections. Um, I am going to be joined by two awesome speakers today. I'm really excited about it. First, of course, we have Aaron Alter. Aaron is the CEO and co-founder of Telgorithm. Aaron is a seasoned telecom expert and a 10 DLC thought leader. Before co-founding Telgorithm, Aaron served as head of telecommunications at Service Titan and was the director of telecommunications at SignalWire. And then we also have a special guest from our team, Zahid Hassan. Hi, Zahid. Uh, Zahid is an implementation and customer success manager who is literally our boots on the ground guy and helps guide customers through 10 DLC and rejection challenges every single day. So we're excited to have them both. These are our leading experts on the team. So let's get into the agenda. Before you do so, first of all, I appreciate you setting this up as always and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, and thanks so much for attending, obviously. Uh, we believe that this is a subject that's uh, on everyone's mind today. And uh, while we spend a lot of time, um, you know, telling you things from our end, and you can watch all of our, or many of our previous sessions going back almost two years. Uh, today, we primarily want to dedicate to the audience here, to give you guys the ability to ask your questions. I want to try to see um, how many, and try to get it to as many as we can today. Separately, uh, we have Zahi joining us as well here, as Samantha mentioned, um, and he is literally boots on the ground. So he'll be helping me out with some of the nuanced answers here. Uh, and it's not only Zahid, by the way, but we have a team of experts on our end. It's not just sometimes myself or, you know, uh, that you may feel, hey, we want to get the, the top level stuff here. So by joining anyone on the Telgorithm team uh, is not just going to be answering your issue to hand it to someone else, but everyone on our team, uh, we strive very hard to make sure everyone on our team in and of themselves is an expert. Uh, and that's something that we hold in high regard. Anyways, fire it away, uh, Samantha. Yeah, I can testify that even the marketing team is expected to be experts. <laughs> Aaron's right. Um, so in terms of the agenda, we're going to keep it light. We always say that, but we really are keeping it light this time because we know your questions are a priority today and they're very nuanced a lot of times. So we, we know we want to give a lot of time for that. Um, so what we're going to look at as a group is most common questions and challenges that we are seeing from our customers and our prospects around 10 DLC campaign compliance. We're going to look at some of the newest rules and regulations that we've seen uh, that might be causing some of your rejections if you're not aware of them. Um, the importance of good customer support, we really do believe that that is the difference between an API provider that's going to get you to success with 10 DLC and your customers versus not. And then we'll dive into Q&A. But before we go into any of this, we do have two questions for you guys, if you don't mind humoring us with a poll. Um, so we're going to pop up some options. Which, which have you experienced the most issues with in terms of rejections? Brand issues, campaign description, campaign call to action, campaign sample messages, something else, or you're not sure, maybe you're not the person that does them. We just want to kind of get a sense of where everyone is at and where you're struggling the most so that we know where to focus our time. I'll give this a few seconds. Appreciate everyone's feedback here. We have that call to action. A few more seconds. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Okay, we can call it there. Let's see the results. Okay. Noted, Zahid and Aaron. Good stuff. All right. And then one more, if you don't mind. We just want to know, is your current API provider supporting you through these registration challenges? Like we said, we believe that customer support really makes all the difference when it comes to being successful. So just want to know how it's going on your side. Okay. Radio silence is tough. Oh, 
Okay, guys, I think that's all we need to know. Thank you so much for participating in the poll. Here are the results for you to check out. All right, then without further ado, we are gonna dive into the most common questions that we are seeing and the most common challenges that we're seeing on our, on our side at a very high level. So Aaron, I will pass this over to you. For sure, and thanks again. And thanks everyone for providing that feedback. So uh, I will address the first one up on here. Uh, I'll try to high level it because um, again, you should check out our prior sessions. We've discussed this, this specific topic in detail, but basically high level here, campaign service provider versus reseller. So anyone that is listening here, that is what's called, and again, I mentioned her name arbitrarily, but in Twilio land, it's known as an ISV or an independent software vendor, or very simply put, if you are an application and your customers who are businesses use your application, aka they are your they are brands in this ecosystem, to send messages to their consumers, the end users, via their campaigns, then you are what's called a ISV or a campaign service provider. You are not a reseller. A reseller would mean that you're in the cloud telecommunications industry and you're simply reselling telecommunications APIs that your provider is providing you with to your customers. So that's just at a high level. To double click a little bit further, campaign service providers, the only way to be a true CSP is to go directly to campaignregistry.com not Twilio.com, not Plevo.com, uh, not any of their trust hubs, but to go directly to the campaign registry itself at campaignregistry.com, hitting the register button where it literally will clearly define what a CSP is and going through an application process to become a CSP. So this is in adverse to being a reseller. Reseller, again, that setup means you're providing all of your tax ID information for your customers, the brands, to your provider and they are the CSP. So just a couple of high levels here. Uh, if you are a reseller model today, that means that all of those brands and campaigns that you're sharing with your CSP belongs to them. Those are non-transferable, number one. You also don't get a lot of insight. So many of you, I see so the survey here, not getting a lot of help on things. Well, when you submit a campaign uh, and it's not directly to the registry as a CSP, rather, as a reseller format directly to your messaging provider, you have no a bit, you have no color into what's actually happened. How do you know they even sent that campaign to anywhere? How do you know they sent it to the DCA? How do you know they even sent it to the registry? I'll even uh, put a quick tip out there. I don't want everyone to go crazy here, but if you actually send an email to support at campaignregistry.com, anyone can do this and provide that campaign ID. Many times we've seen uh, people find out that forget about being processed, they don't even have a record of the campaign at all. So one is ownership, uh, visibility into campaign approvals, um, vettings don't belong to you either. So again, the purpose that the campaign registry created a campaign service provider account was done for a specific reason. And I would strongly recommend anyone here that again, has an application, where they service multiple businesses or multiple businesses use their application to send messages to their customer. It's not a nicety. You should be going to campaignregistry.com and registering. There's a one-time registration there. I believe now there's a, a brief certification. There's no test or anything, but they give a brief training, which is very valuable uh, in general to get now um, and get yourself unlocked to get to own your compliance and to get the visibility and the relationship with the campaign registry that you need and also own your compliance, be, being able to enable yourself to multi-thread. So again, anyone here that's on here should very strongly suggest uh, that you don't waste any time on that frontier. And even if you've already registered campaigns and brands in not the best way, you can always continue start new going forward and then ultimately transition whatever legacy stuff you had. Again, this is just, free advice and a recommendation per the TCR on how uh, folks should be doing things. Um, moving along here, uh, I know many of you mentioned here on that survey, different areas that you're now seeing rejections on or common rejection areas. Basically, we've cordoned this out into four different categories that you notice when you create a campaign brand. So you could have brand issues with the brand being verified and we'll talk to the website. Part of things, you could have campaign and content attribute, attribute section where it talks about different things, opt-in language, 
opt-in message or things like, uh, is this a direct lender? Or are you using a URL? So we could talk to some of those chain. We'll talk to some of those changes today. The campaign description I did see, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, call to action section was the biggest uh, one now that was taken on the survey. And no doubt so, because there has been significant uh, changes in this area of recent. Uh, and then sample messages, we did see that one. I think that came up second on the survey you just took about what is necessary for a sample message and what is not necessary for a sample message. Before I get into some of the specifics here, we have Zahid with us. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add here high level uh, on the latest, and we're going to get to some of the latest tips in a second, but that we're missing on here that you just want to call out over the top over here? Uh, no, definitely. Thank you very much again, once again to everyone. And uh, yeah, so you have touched all the points as of now. CTA uh, is sitting the highest uh, of all rejections, uh, then some brand details as well as uh, sample messages. So these are the uh, high levels of current rejections. Awesome. And just to make sure we're clear, uh, Zahid, on this, the call to action section of the uh, camp when you're creating campaign is actually two sections. One is a campaign description that is meant to describe what is the use case in a little bit more detail than just saying customer service or marketing, what is the specific use case for this campaign? The call to action section, the purpose of that field is literally to tell DCA, uh, which is the upstream aggregator and the network operators, um, what is the process or where the end users that will be messaged from this campaign, from phone numbers that are associated with this campaign, how are they opting in, right? A lot of what, what's been trying to uh, be done here to keep this new ecosystem, this A to P 10 ELC ecosystem clean is making sure we're preventing spam. And I always talk about this on previous webinars, but this is not the result, this is not the end goal, but compliance is the entryway ticket to getting onto the A2P path, which provides uh, many benefits. Um, and so this call to action section is the area we would describe to the DCA that is gonna be reviewing these campaigns upstream. Uh, where is it? Where are the places? Maybe it's only one place, maybe it's 10 places. Where are the places that the end users that you're going to be messaging where is it that they are opting in? Are they opting in on your website? Are they opting in from some email being sent? Are they exactly. opting in at, at, a, at an appointment, right? And so this is the area where you would delineate and put specific um, language. You could even paste a URL there if needed to let the DC know specifically, this is the area where folks for this campaign are going to opt in. I know there's going to be some questions and we're going to take a lot of questions on this, but I just want to kind of high level what this section is meant for. There is, I believe, a 40 character minimum requirement for that field. You can't just say uh, in person and that's it. You got to give a little bit more detail. I'll even add uh, if the opt-in is being done over the phone verbally, they want to actually see some sort of script about what's being said over the phone. Thank you, sir. Um, and by taking down your number, you are opting in, yada, yada, yada. And you put that little brief script into the call to action section. Again, this is an area, as I do see here on the feedback, of major focus uh, of late. Uh, I'll also add one other point. You're going back up to the brand. So brand is a number of uh, newer things or nuanced things here. So just at a very basic level for a brand to become verified, the EI, there's, and so there's a lot of, many times you hear a lot of confusion about this and we validate it. We have a close relationship directly with the campaign registry who verifies and validates brands. So campaigns are not approved by registry. I don't want to confuse anybody here. Brands are the only way that yes. a brand to become verified is done by the TCR itself. They only look for two data points. That's it. They don't look at the address. They don't look at any other information. There is one piece of information they look at for your brand to become verified. I'm not talking about added vetting and a higher risk score. That's a separate conversation. Simply to get your brand verified. They, what they do is they use a, an external vetting partner known as Aegis Mobile, uh, and they use Aegis Mobile to validate that the tax ID matches the legal name on file with the government entity that that tax ID is, was created with. So if that legal name matches the exact tax ID, that tax ID that's on, the, uh, that's on file with that government agency, that will be verified. If there is a mismatch there, 
it will take more time and it will not be verified. Now, sometimes people apply the day before. They just opened up a new business and, you know, Aegis doesn't have the right updated information. In such a situation, you could email, again, being a CSP of the TCR, as I mentioned, you'd simply just email them, hey, I just updated it, or provide a document directly to the TCR showing this, and usually they'll unlock them. But I will just, the highlight here, all that is being looked at, there's nothing else being looked at in that regard rather than the tax ID matching the legal name that it's on file with the, the governing entity. That's for brand. There's a few other points under brand as well. Uh, you must put a website under the brand. It used to be, it was an optional thing. Now it is mandatory for all DCs. They want to see a website. Um, you can, it should be an established website. Uh, it cannot be a broken link, uh, number one, because they will go and check that and they do go to the website. Number two, uh, even if sometimes, you know, you go to a website and you'll see like this uh, screen come up, it says uh, security uh, issue, C click here to proceed forward. If they hit into that, that's going to be considered an unsecured site. That will also cause a rejection on that side by the DCA as well. So you want to make sure that whatever URL you're putting in, that they're going to click on it. You click on it. It just goes straight to that site and it is a secured site. In addition to that, they also look for some items on these websites. Number one, regardless of what you wrote into that call to action section, if let's just say, hey, I take all of my opt-ins over the phone, DCA is still going to go to the website that you put under the brand, and they're going to look at the website. Not every tab on your website, but they're going to look at the contact area. Maybe sometimes you'll have get a quote or you'll have some form. If they find any form on your website, that mandatorily collects a phone number, mandatory. That means you cannot submit the form without entering such phone number. And there is no opt-in language on that form itself. They will reject that campaign. Even if you said in the call to action section, I only accept opt-ins over the phone. If they find an opt-in place on your website that is mandatory and there's no opt-in language there, they will still reject your campaign. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, now all DCAs are requiring a privacy policy on your website as well. They are looking for that. If there's no privacy policy, they will reject the campaign from that as well, just from that standpoint. And even if you have a privacy policy, you need to make sure in that privacy policy that it discusses either one of two things, thanks for forwarding that here, uh, sharing, so sharing meaning, uh, how do you share information that you collect? So if you don't have any language about sharing at all, you need to proactively add, we do not share information. So even if right now your privacy policy says nothing in that regard, it just talks about how you collect information and not how you share it, you proactively need to add a line that says, we do not share your information at all, or, if you do share information in many industries, people have various needs, obviously reasons to do that. As long as you're right, we share your information or we may share your information with third parties, except for marketing or promotional reasons. You need to call that out. So either you're doing an umbrella that says we do not share information at all, or if you share information, that is fine. As long as you delineate it, they must see that except for promotional or marketing reasons. If those things are not done, even if you have a privacy policy, you will get a rejection on that campaign from the DCA side of things. Uh, if you want to slide back to the prior slide, I just want to make sure I'm going in order here. So we talked about brand websites. We talked about uh, campaign. So we talked about CTA description. Let me talk briefly to campaign and content attributes before I do that. Zahid, anything I'm missing here that you want to add on any of the points I just mentioned? Uh, no, everything is fine. So just to uh, simply clarify about CTA things. So this is literally you as an ISV walking through DCA on how the opt-in is collected. That's the simplified version. And uh, that must have to be at least 40 characters for CTA, I mean, call to action. And campaign description must have to be at least 20 characters with matching the use case that you chose uh, for that particular campaign. Awesome. That's it. Awesome. So just a note on that one, campaign description must be at least 20 characters in there as well. Again, just providing a very basic description rather than just a one word should easily allow you to fill that that 20 character limit. 
Um, that is correct. Ne next step up over here is campaign and content attributes. The biggest one that I want to call out of change here is uh, there are three sections when you first start in the, under campaign content attributes. One is uh, called opt-in message. One is called opt-out message. And one is called help message. And really within these drop-down boxes under campaign and content attributes, <clears throat> there are two subfields. One says keyword and one says message. For the keyword field, what they're looking for is, so for instance, opt-in message is basically all the keywords that your system supports that allow an end user to opt in. So that might be start, continue, yes. Those are all, you only have to put a minimum of one keyword here. You don't need to list them all. You can, you don't need to. Um, and so you just need to put at least one keyword there that a user could send to either if they opted out or for a first time want to opt in to a given campaign, those are the keywords you will put there. Additionally, now they require an opt-in message. So when somebody sends that start or yes, that I want to opt in, you need to be able to send or have the ability to send a confirmation message to this end user with the following things. Now brand, you don't necessarily have to put in, although it is nice to put in there, but, um, you do have to put in that you have now opted in to receive messages from X campaign. Um, you do have to put in message and data rates may apply. You have to put in um, the how often. So this is a new one that's come up is message frequency. Uh, although uh, DCA does allow you to, to simply write um, message frequency may vary. So you will have that in there as well. Uh, and then you'll put an opt out language on there, obviously, because you're sending them a text. You'll put stop, uh, reply, stop to cancel. So it's really uh, you're putting in uh, that you're what you're opting in for. The date, message, and data rates may apply. Your frequency, and then the opt out language on there. For uh, I'm sorry for opt in for opt out as well. Very similar. You got to put in all those bits of information. And for help, help is when somebody responds. Hey, help! You should at least have some way that you're describing what happens when they type back help. Is it a message confirmation that you're giving, or what other detail that that they can get help from is what you're putting in there. So these are fields that cannot no longer be blank. They need to be filled out both with the keywords, or at least one keyword, and with, with those pointers on the messages for those things there. Anything you want to add on that one? Because uh, I know that that's been uh, one of the new those newer things of late, uh, Zahid. Anything that I've missed on that front? Uh, no, you tasked actually uh, the right way because a lot of people actually, uh, you know, uh, mixes up those things. Sometimes I found some people put opt-in sample messages in opt-out uh, places or maybe in help. So uh, definitely the right message and keyword should be on the right place uh, with at least some, uh, you know, a clarification uh, within the message that the audience or end user will uh, get from you. Yes. Um, also, one other point here, um, if, in regards to content and attributes, if you're using URL, a URL, check it off. But another big one that comes up is direct lenders. If you do any form of lending, direct lending is fine, specifically direct lending. Uh, so make sure to check that off. That's, I believe, right under the opt-in section. Under content attributes, make sure you're hitting yes on that and not no. So it's fine to be a direct lender, whether you're doing mortgages, whatever it might be. Uh, just make sure you're selecting that because if they do go to your website, which they will, uh, and see that you're offering any lending, even if you're, let's just say you're a contractor or you you lay concrete and somehow your company offers some sort of financing to finance this project, you are considered a lender. Yes, you're a concrete company, but you're also a lender, either a direct lender or a third party lender. Assuming you're a direct lender, you would still need to check off. Yes, we are a direct lender or that if they see that any sort of form of lending on your site, regardless of what you do primarily or what your industry is. Uh, they will reject it for seeing that if you are offering that there as well. Uh, sample messages are very similar to what I would recall that uh, say the opt-in messages are. You want it, you do need to provide brand information there. You should provide some samples of what what, what this material will actually look like, right? It, it should be something related 
to that specific campaign. Yes, you could have a mixed type of campaign. Uh, I believe you need a minimum of two sample messages to get a campaign approved. Uh, you could go all the way up to five, which would be recommended, but you should add in the brand information, the content, maybe even paste in a URL if you're gonna be using one so they get a sample of that as well. Uh, and there should be opt-out language in every single one of those samples as well. Anything you wanna add on, on sample messages, Zahid? Uh, it is, yeah, definitely. It is also good to add a uh, red disclosure, which is message and data rate may apply, mm -hmm. but it is not necessary, like not super mandatory, but it is good to have over there. And also, if you plan to use any phone number within your message, then it is good to check mark that option under campaign and content attribut attributions, which is embedded phone, and then put that phone number within the message sample as well. Awesome. If you want to slide over to the next slide here, I think we covered most of the high levels here. Just to make sure we didn't miss anything, just to highlight here, we already discussed the po privacy policy is now mandatory, except for sole proprietorship. So if you have a true sole proprietor, I repeat, a true sole proprietor, not a starter brand, a true sole proprietor means that you're a new business that does not have a tax ID. You just, you're a very tiny business, just started out. Uh, you might be selling apparel online and just got a website from Wix or something. Uh, then uh, you're a sole proprietor and there's a separate process for that. But aside from sole proprietor, uh, you need, must have a privacy policy on your website. Message frequency, um, again, a quick pointer here. You could always say message frequency depends on your activity. You don't have to put in an exact number. Message and data rates may apply. You wanna put that into your opt-out disclosures in the message. As we discussed, call to action section should be 40 characters minimum, and it should be clear to include at, at least one opt-in. Uh, oh, here's another point uh, that we mentioned as well. In addition to showing your opt-ins, they wanna know also how you're storing your opt-ins. So let's just assume you're using Salesforce as a CRM. You would write that stored in CRM. They wanna know not only how you're gathering the opt-in, when the opt-in information is being submitted, whether it be verbally, whether it be uh, in person, whether it be on a website, how, where exactly are you storing this information? They would like that to also be listed out in the call to action section uh, as well. Um, that's, those are the items that I would cover of late on this frontier. I also wanna point out one thing more high level. There's there, when it comes to, we deal obviously with many different industries, and many different customers, we see many things. And obviously everyone looking at this and rightfully so, there's a lot of, I will say this is beyond annoyance, right? We're seeing constant new changes, new updates, new rules, different providers are saying different things and that becomes no doubt very frustrating. But even more than that, I think what a lot of legitimate businesses are looking to do more than anything is to look at, okay, I'm okay with this, but up to some level, uh, but I wanna be able to streamline it. So. When we think streamlining here, there's two sides of the coin. What are the things that you as a CSP are in your, that is in your control and what is not in your control? Let me uh, break down what I mean by this. So if you are a CSP of the campaign registry, the campaign registry offers a portal and offers you an API. Almost everything aside from your customer's website, everything actually aside from your customer's website uh, and their tax ID and brand name, uh, you can really, and their tax ID, you could really control, right? So you, and you can control that via the, the TCR's API. So as long as you create a template on all of this stuff, which we could share templates for you, you could just literally streamline the creation of all of those portions of the campaign. The only difficulty you would have is getting your customer if either they don't have a website or they have a website that's collecting opt-in that doesn't have opt-in message or they don't have a privacy policy, anything that's related to their website, you don't necessarily have control with your from, from your own standpoint. You can't update that in TCR. You have to let your customer have your customer uh, update that information there. And sometimes we understand, obviously, depending on your customer, some of them may have to go through a legal scenario. Some of them may not even know who's running their website. Uh, maybe it's some third party when they first got started and it's not easy to update a privacy policy or add it, or maybe they need to get legal involved and that's not easy to do. So again, I just want to point out from a streamlined perspective, anything in the registry, if you have access as a CSP to their APIs, Yes, we can give you all the detailed information. You could streamline all that. Anything that's on the website, you can't really control. You can give that guidance up front, but there is, and you could talk to us about this, there are certain instances where we've we've seen DCA allow for templating. So in other words, uh, 
as part of your services to be able to offer a website to your customer uh, that they could leverage that is fully compliant. And you create a template out of that that is fully DCA approved and looked at. And then essentially, instead of using their current website, they would use that website instead. And that is then sent, gets sent across. And that sometimes allows for certain customers that have certain brands as they are labeled in this ecosystem that cannot make changes to their site to rather leverage their provider to allow them to make certain templated sites. And uh, depending on the scenario, we could work with you along with DCA on trying to find exactly what that looks like to enable that here. So I'll just mention that as one final point as we talk about a lot of these changes here. But with that said, um, uh, we could proceed forward to the next uh, agenda item here. Yeah, we just want to recap really quickly at a high level how important good customer support is, something we believe in. Is there anything you want to say about that, Aaron, before we get into Q&A and we can dive into the questions? Yeah, I mean, it kind of, we wanted to add it here to highlight it, but it goes without saying in today's day and age is particularly with all these, um, you know, mandates on A to P 10 ELC. Uh, you know, one of the things that we'll say is obviously there's been delays in approvals and something that even we were impacted by throughout the summer. We're getting to a place where we're much better at that, but more than even waiting for an approval is getting an approval, right? Uh, so uh, you could have a, a, your campaign processed in 30 seconds, but if it keeps getting rejected and you don't have a clear reason why it's getting rejected, you're pretty much gonna be at a standstill and not really have a good uh, you know, experience either yourself and truly for your customer. And so therefore it makes sense to partner with a partner and a provider that will provide you with the information. Now, you may not always like the information. We don't always like the information, but we'll give you the information and work with you along with our close relationship with DCA to make sure we come up with a path or can find a path to understand what's going on. Many times, I'm sure there's people that are probably on this webinar that just get reject, reject, reject. There's just some either no reason at all or just some vague reason. You then send an email to your uh, rep there or open, they ask you to open a ticket. And then there's no cohesive response to actually even what it even means. Something like I'd say website. Well, what about my website? I have a website. Thank you. But what about it? Right. You're not going to get any of that detail. Uh, so it's important to partner with a provider that does have that close relationship that can provide you with the detail, not only even after the fact, before the fact. So a lot of our process to talk about Telgorithm before we even sign up a customer. You have to be a CSP. You have to share campaigns with us. We take a look at that proactively. We understand you. We understand your customer. Understand your verticals. We work in advance proactively on all of this information to make sure you get set up up front. Now things are changing, and so we try to provide those updates accordingly to make sure you get them. But it is important to whatever provider you're using to make sure that they're proactively as best as possible providing you with that feedback and the specifics here rather than just say, hey, website or call to action section. You don't even know what a call to action section is, let alone what it's meant for or what's being expected there. And so this again, should go without saying, but we're saying it because uh, unfortunately, uh, what we've seen in, in a lot of parts of the industry, this is not the status quo and not the case. Um, and we're hoping that uh, a lot of what Telgorithm uh, does is try to solve that uh, as well. Perfect, well said. Okay, so two housekeeping items. If we do not get to your question, um, we will either follow up with you directly after or you can reach out to us at any time. You can hit us up on email, team at telgorithm.com or through our contact page on our website. Um, so your question will be answered, if not here, after. Um, and secondly, just please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of Zoom and we will dive in. Okay, you guys ready? Go for it, okay. fire away. Perfect, so starting at the top here, Okay, if you have multiple opt-in channels available to end users, do all of them need to be mentioned and explained in the call to action section? <laughs> Zahid, I'll let you take this one. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, you do not need to mention all of the options as long as you have one option and you do not have any mandatory phone number collection field on the web form, you are good to go with Telgorithm. Yes, I'll, and I'll, I'll actually add to that. Uh, as he mentioned, with Telgorithm. So uh, there are some DCAs that are still, again, a lot of this call to action section has been there for a while. What's the information that needs to get added is what's been in flux of recently. Uh, and just to highlight the question, just to make sure everyone who joined here understands what the question is, I'm just going to re-highlight it real quick, is if I have three ways that, that, that users can opt in, do I need to mention 
all the ways in the call to action section, or I could just mention one of them or two of them. Do I need to mention them all? So there are some DCAs that do require them all. Uh, the DCA that we're partnering with as of late, as of late, we don't expect things to get, we expect things, we're starting to see things recede, uh, that only one of them is required. So here's the point. I'm gonna give an example to make sure this is clear. So let's just say you're a salon and someone comes in and they uh, basically give their opt-in at an appointment in person. You can write uh, in, in that section again, at appointment, this is what is said and it's given in person, yada, yada, yada. Then, in addition to in, in person, this spa or salon also has a website. And on the website, there's a form. And on that form is mandatorily required to enter a phone number, but that's not mentioned in the call to action section. DC will still look at that. And as long as that form has the right opt-ins and there's the right privacy policy, even though that call to action section is not quote, that area of opt-in, or that way of opt-in, uh, is not mentioned in the call to action section, that's fine. As long as it mentions one of those call to option sections. That said, it is still strongly recommended to try and add all of them in there. It's a recommendation, it is not required for minimum requirement, and it has to be there. I'll also add to make sure that your opt-in is required. So if you say opt-in is on the website and there is no opt-in on the website because you don't accept phone numbers on the site, well, then how are they opting in, right? We've seen people mark, opt in on web form on the website. And then the DCA goes to the website where we go to the website, we see the form, there's a first name, a last name, an email and some other thing, but there's no phone number, but you specifically right. said they're opting in on the website. So if that that doesn't check out, you're gonna run into a rejection because we're then there's essentially no opt-in. We can't do it on the site and you haven't listed another way. So I'm gonna reject it. Um, I, that would be, again, any more specifics, please reach out to us and we can deal with your specific situation. Perfect. Um, okay, the next question came in when we were talking about CSPs. So this person said that they are a CSP by our definition, how you described it at the top of the presentation, but uh, we are a Twilio client and I was told we are treated as a reseller by their definition. And they just wanted to know if this makes sense. Uh, I can't answer what Twilio's definitions are, but I can answer what the campaign registry's definitions are, which is what matters. And you could validate this, fortunately, on campaignregistry.com. Not only that, I'll even add, I mentioned it earlier, the campaign registry now, when you apply to become a CSP as of two weeks ago, uh, before they give you access to their APIs and portal, so after their background check, uh, they now biweekly, I believe it's every Monday and Wednesday, uh, I believe they began this two weeks ago. They now give a training session that is mandatory for all CSPs. You don't have to take a test, but you have to attend a session. And in that session, they clearly go over this information about what a CSP is, where you stand in the ecosystem. Very simply put, a CSP has a CSP ID and all brands could, will tie to that CSP ID in the ecosystem. A reseller, that means that you give a tax ID and legal name to a Twilio, as you mentioned, a Twilio, uh, they then take that information and using their CSP account, register you. A reseller, there is no such thing in the ecosystem as a reseller ID because there isn't one. It's not really a real entity from that nature and that perspective. So the only way you can get a CSP ID, which brands are specifically associated with CSP IDs, not reseller IDs, because there is no such thing as a reseller ID. Um, that is the only way you could truly own the brands and then the campaigns that are associated. I'll even add one point on this. While brands, so begin with brands are owned by that CSP ID, campaigns today, when you elect what's called a CNP or your connectivity partner, your messaging provider, um, they are not switchable on a campaign today when you have your own TCR account. That is going to change. They are, the TCR is now working on a plan and a process that will potentially make that interchangeable. But again, that's as you as the owner of the CSP and brands. But if someone else owns that, let's, as you mentioned, Twilio, why would Twilio want to change your campaign to go under Plevo? right? They would have no incentive to do that. They want to lock in. I just mentioned their name arbitrarily, but you as a CSP owning your accounts and only do you own your brands and all of their vettings, their campaigns, while today are static to the CNP that was select elected, that will change over time and you will be able to switch that accordingly in the future. Again, another reason why 
you want to be a CSP. But again, just to button up here, regardless of what anyone is telling you, unless you are creating your brands and unless you are creating your campaigns within the campaign registry, whether it be at their portal or your API, you are simply not a campaign service provider. That is a simple fact. Again, nothing to do with Telgorithm. You can go to campaignregistry.com. Email, I believe you can email customer success at campaignregistry.com and ask them this question directly. They will give you that information. You could even join uh, voluntarily that course that they're now giving, even if you don't uh, weren't wasn't available when you signed up. They now will send you an invite to that and you'll see that information directly from them by yourself independently. Perfect. Good questions. Thank you. Um, okay, we're back to an opt-in question. I think you guys have answered this, but I'm going to ask it again because I think that this is a problem that a lot of people have and there is confusion. So just to be mm -hmm. very clear, if opt-in is only in person at your shop, your salon, whatever, would that ever get approved when you're doing a campaign submission? Yes. So if op if your only mode of opt-in, you should write a script in that CTA. When someone comes in, we take their name down on the on the CRM because, as I mentioned, one of the other points is you have to put in there how that information is stored. So you'll say when someone comes in, we ask customer uh, by giving us this information here in person, you are committing to opt-in. Yes, they could only have in person if they want to have in person. But again, if they find this on, the, if they go to the website, which are going to go to the website, um, and some something is not um, on the website is not compliant. So here's another uh, example where where some of this confusion could be coming from. Assume you write only in person. That's fine. The, the DCA is still going to go to your website. Every brand requires a website. They're still going to go to the website regardless. They're going to check if there's a privacy policy. They're also going to check if there is any form there that mandatorily collects phone numbers that is not compliant. So you don't have to put that in the CTA, but if they find a form on the website that is not compliant, meaning that there's no opt-in language there or that or something related to that, they're still going to reject the campaign. So you didn't have to list out all of your call to action sections, but essentially on their own, they found a non-compliant uh, mode of opt-in. Uh, and so you weren't rejected because you didn't add it to the CTA. You were more rejected because they found another area of compliance that was not compliant. Makes sense. Okay, cool. Thank you. This question I like. I don't think we've spoken to this specifically. Um, so does the URL on the SMS have to be for the website's domain? And the meaning is if you use a tiny URL, which is how you can brand and shorten a link, um, will that make the process fail? Zahid, you want to take this one? I see you smiling over there. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So any, so it is called parking site or parking domain or URL shortener. So anything, if you use as a URL short shortener or any, uh, if you use your website to park on another website, for example, Wix.com, as Aaron already mentioned, these things are red flag. So yes, yeah, so you will uh, end up with rejections. Aaron, maybe you have some yeah. examples with that. No, that's exactly right. The bitly shorteners are a big no-go. Not only that, what we have seen sometimes is Folks will either not mention under the content attribute section that they use a URL, or they'll say they use a URL. And by the way, you'll notice there's a, a highlight button in the portal, a little I, you highlight over it, it literally says, it's a pop-up that comes up in the actual campaign registry that says, Bitly's and, and uh, those shorteners are not allowed. Sometimes we see that. And by the way, that is something that is heavily monitored on the on ATP tenancy by network operators. And even if you're fully registered, can cause flags uh, and cause uh, potential flag messages uh, if you begin to use it. The proper way is is to have the uh, create a domain. So what's what's important is there's two parts. There's usually the first part, whatever it is, dot com forward slash yada yada yada. As long as the first part of that, right, whatever it is, dot com matches the domain, that's fine. Whatever you put beyond that, they're more flexible in that regard. So bit.ly, shorteners, all of that stuff, no good. You should use essentially a private, if you're gonna use a private, use a private domain that's branded is what is recommended uh, on that side of things. They do look for shorteners. And I'll even add to the mix, if you're using a shortener and all of a sudden your opt-out rates, which are even, that's the highest, that's what they monitor for right away, start to grow. You can run into uh, trouble pretty fast. 
So you're, to clarify, you're saying that when you submit your campaign and when you're sending messages to customers, you shouldn't be using any URL shorteners. Right. Even if somehow you managed in the past to get your campaign approved before they were looking at that, I will tell you that shorteners are there. There, they look at that very closely. Okay. Cool. That's helpful. I didn't know that. Um, okay. The next question is around repeatability. Um, I think that you kind of alluded to an answer here with talking about templates, but let me read you the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all of our use cases will be exactly the same. If we were able to get one campaign approved, could we lock that down and just send the exact same info every time for a new brand? In other words, let's say I finally get one campaign approved. Now I need to go get that mm -hmm. same campaign approved for 50 brands. Can I send the same info 50 more times or do I need to make each campaign slightly different? You don't. As long as uh, there are going to be variances there, right? So, uh, for instance, in the message samples, right? And you could program this. We have customers that have done this. Uh, the brand name is going to be different in that message sample because you have to include the brand name in the message sample. So as long as you're delineating, you're not using the same website for all of these brands. It's an individual website for all of these brands. You know, obviously the email is going to be different. We didn't talk much about that one today um, uh, as far as the email goes. Um that's a, another little area. But again, just a high level answer to your question here is there's nothing wrong with templating. Uh, if they're truly different brands, you're not trying to create a scenario where I'm using multiple brands for the same number or the same campaign, and I'm just trying to extend my throughput reasons, and they're looking for that. Uh, but if you truly are looking to streamline your process, no issue with that at all, as long as you're going to fill in those separate fields there. And again, to the, that's the part that you can control. The part you can control is your customer's website. Uh, if they have a separate hoster than you, uh, in that scenario there, you could also work towards a path of you becoming the host of their website and provide them with a compliant stuff there that they could leverage there. But absolutely, you, there's no issue with having customers that are exactly the same, the same use case, as long as you're delineating different tax ID for each of these brands, right? It's a different business, uh, different email, different website, uh, and you're putting in that specific brand information under those samples, that's not an issue. Okay, cool. Um, this question is lender specific. The question is, uh, do DCA, does DCA look for extra items on website or campaign info when lender option is selected? I mean, as I mentioned earlier, um, so lending, you need to be a direct lender, no third party stuff that's not allowed. That's per CTIA guidelines, actually. Third party lending is not allowed. Uh, so they, anytime they see lending or some of these industries or credit or debt collection, any of the things in these uh, areas, there are sometimes, you know, gray areas here and they're going to look a little bit further than, you know, like I said, we have a use case, one of our customers' uh, services, uh, their customers are salons, right? That's a, you know, everyday uh, business, a blue collar business, nothing much to look at over there. But uh, if somebody is in the lending industry, because historically a lot of spam had come from that, that's an area that they are right now sensitive to. They are going to look for the specifics on that site. So if it's, you have to be a direct lender, you have to mark on the campaign attribute that you're a direct lender. Other than that, if everything else on the website checks out, so you're a direct lender, you have opt-ins where they are, you have your privacy policy, you have the non-sharing clause that says we do not share information with third parties uh, for marketing or promotional reasons. If everything else checks off, yes, they're going to do a little bit more of a rigorous check. But if everything checks off, if you're a direct lender and you marked it as such, no issue. You should be able to get approved. Okay. Yeah, just just to add before you go to the next question. So there was a tiny little uh, example. For example, pay a, buy now pay letter. This also falls under this section, by the way. So many times Good I have point. seen our customers uh, do not understand. Hey, we don't do lending. We don't do <laughs> any financing. Why are getting? Uh, why we are getting rejected, right? And then it, it was found out uh, that particular brand or business is uh, to somewhat they were offering loans to their customers. There you go. So buy now, pay later. Essentially, pay later uh, is a loan, right? So obviously that can be delineated from that. Could be a, a, an innocent miss there, but anything that's related to that, again, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're a direct lender, as long as you delineate everything else, nothing wrong with that. You just have to, that is an area where you may have to make sure that, you know, you get everything lined up correctly. Cool. Okay. Thank you guys.
Um, all right, this question is for clarification. It sounds like in a previous webinar, this person thought or believed that we had said that you could add opt-in language to your website, get approved, and then remove everything. Can you revisit that if that's true at all or how that maybe is interpreted yeah. or misinterpreted? I'm not sure. Sure. Um, good question. So when it comes to campaign approvals, really it's two, there's two sides of the coin. There is, I need to get my campaigns approved. Why? So that my numbers can become registered so I can send text messages. But there's really two sides of it is the campaign registration is more of, I don't know you yet. I don't know you. I don't know your customer. Tell me a little bit about information about you and your customer and their use cases. And so this is kind of a, we'll call it a pre-vet to know what the DCA that this traffic will be flowing through kind of, and the network operators are also associated with TCR and they can see this to try to get a feel for what kind of traffic we can expect on the phone numbers that are ultimately associated with this campaign. Now that's campaign approval. But once, as I mentioned before, I forget what we were alluding to. Um, I think we were talking about shortler, shorteners, right? So even if you marked previously that I don't use a shortener or any URL, but you start to use shorteners in your messages, they're still going to monitor your traffic. So your traffic is still going to be monitored. First, they start monitor, man, uh, monitoring opt-out information and things of this nature. And if they start to see anything there, they could. there is the ability to suspend the campaign. So there's a creation of the campaign to get you going. But at any given time, if they detect something that is off, they could suspend your campaign. And then they could go further than that. I don't want to go up the chain on, on this one right now, but there's a checks and balance system with this, the way this uh, ecosystem is built. And so therefore, um, when you're going through the process of getting your campaign approved, um, you want to make sure that ultimately your traffic is going to match what is being said there. That being said, not everything ties up here. So as an example, um, uh, you get approved and you add a privacy policy to your site. Uh, you add that language, promotion, marketing, or whatever. Once your campaign is approved, they're never going to go back and look at it again. It's approved. They they can't even barely get to the queue of the new stuff, let alone go back to the old stuff. So um, they're not going to go back there. So as long as your content that you're sending is going to remain clean, then you're fine. However, if all of a sudden your opt-out rates start to grow and your content gets flagged for whatever reason, they can go back and either suspend your campaign, ask you to fix that again at some point. But this is more after the fact if you run into a problem. But if you know that all of your customers, customers want to receive the messages, they're all opting in, they all want to get this stuff, you're not going to have high opt-out rates, and you're just simply looking to get your campaign approved, you can absolutely add this information and then take it off later. It will not change anything. Once your DCA is yes, it is yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a healthcare specific question next. So it says, for healthcare, I am under the impression that SMS notifications can be sent to an individual as part of a quote unquote treatment plan, which is typically addressed via a patient's consent to care document, which is signed when they come in for their appointment. Since that document is not optional uh, for SMS opt-in, is that cause or concern? Is that a cause for concern or rejection? Can you repeat the question one more time? I want to make sure I get it clearly so I answer it right. Yeah, of course. Um, basically, these uh, this okay. These SMS notifications are part of a treatment plan. It's addressed when you come into the office. It's not optional. You must put in your phone number I and see. accept those okay. notifications. So okay. they're just asking if it, because it is not optional in this document, is that a cause for concern or rejections? You have the ability when you have a customer to say, hey, you're signing up that allows me to send you messages, right? That's the whole purpose of an opt-in, regardless of what it is. If I go to Best Buy and I sign a thing that says that, hey, I want to, I accept and I agree to receive promotions versus, you know, I want to get updates because my uh, heart rate is going low. Uh, from, a, from a CTI perspective, a CTIA perspective and carrier perspective, it's the same thing. Do you have opt-in, which sounds like here you definitely have because it's part of the service, which is awesome. Um, uh, then there's no issue there at all, but the, that's a great thing. You have this opt-in stuff, you have that form. What I thought maybe the question was going is, do I have to delineate that it's collected here? You should, you should write that in the call to action section that our business offers this uh, this this service, this health service, which is uh, you know urgent major, uh, and this is how we're collecting opt-in. You could even now, even if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Zahid on this, but there's a section for MMS, 
uh, where you can add attachments. Uh, and many times they'll ask to add an attachment of a screenshot of what that form looks like. So you could say in the call to action section, someone comes in for a doctor's appointment visits, they mandatorily opt in to receive updates about their health. And then you could just take a screenshot of that and upload that into the actual TCR so they could even see that. It's not necessary, but they could see that on there as well. So um, no issue on that side. And it's great. Uh, that's that's mandatory opt-in. That means you have that information. You're holding it on file. That's great. That's what they want to see on there. That, that's the best of the best. Yeah, just to add a uh, simple thing here. Uh, yes, so... Since you are collecting opt-in through a form, you can directly use that one. You do not need to use any other type of uh, opt-in method. You can easily use that one. What you can do here is you cannot put that third-party patient plan or whatever uh, the website that is providing this service to that clinic, you cannot provide that link as it will be regarded as a third party uh, ah. company since you cannot share data with third party, right? So you can use that thing. You can write that. You can walk DCA. Uh, this is the form we have. We collect opt-in via this form and then you can uh, direct DCA that here is the place we uploaded for your convenience. So that's it. All right. And correct me if I'm wrong, what you might be alluding to there is that the party that is collecting the opt-in has to match the brand. So it's not that you're going to this place over here and giving them the opt-in and then they're giving it to us. It's rather this that form has our logo on it. This is the form should have the logo. If it's some third party that's collecting that, then it's not you that's getting the opt-in. It's the third party that's getting the opt-in and third party opt-in is no good. And so that that not only applies for other use cases, um, but it also applies to here as well, which I believe is what you're referring to. Yes, that is exactly correct. So yes. that clinic or healthcare professionals, they have to collect that opt-in, not Themselves. any third-party companies. Right. right. Cool. And it may go without saying, but for that physical piece of paper form, you need to have your opt-out, your help message, your help language, your opt-out message, and message frequency, all of those things on there. You, you should ideally, so for opt-ins, you don't necessarily need that. I mean, you just say you're opting in to do this and put all that language there that you would have on a web form. Uh, the place where you have to add the other stuff is under the content attributes under the campaign that we discussed earlier, right? That opt-in, opt-in message, mean being able to respond to that information with the corresponding messages. But as far as opt-in forms, as long as you're writing the basic stuff for opt-in, by giving us your number, you are agreeing that we can reach out to you for X reasons. Um, message frequency may vary, message and data rates may apply. Um, and that, that's pretty much what you need on that side there for that form, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, cool. Um, perfect. Let's see, do we have time for one more question? We're almost out of time. I haven't read through this, so I'm just going to read it live and we'll see what it says. Um, okay, if someone is sending messages only to their own staff, not their customers, uh, for example, server X is down. What is mm -hmm. the simplest way to prove opt-in compliance? Uh, yes. Also, sorry, there's a second part. Let me finish it and we'll see if we need it. Um, also, the usual problem with DCA found some other unrelated form on the website that has a compulsory phone number field apply. Will the usual problem with DCA found some other unrelated form on the website that has a compulsory phone number field apply to that issue? Again, I'm just going to answer the last question first because we touched on it earlier. Okay. Regardless of what you write in the call to action section, the DCA is going to go to your website. If they find any form that absolutely met, that means you cannot submit the form. You can't hit the submit. You're going to get an error if you hit the submit button. You put in your first name, your last name, and the email address. And even if it's 30 other items, but if the phone number is not in there, wasn't filled in that form, and you cannot hit submit, because it'll error you out. That means that that is considered a form that mandatorily requires you to enter your P your your personal and from personal identifiable identifiable information, your PI information. If there is no opt-in language on that form, regardless of what you said your CTA is for this campaign in the registry, they will reject that campaign. Again, does it matter if you wrote that in the call to action section? If they find any form on your website that is not compliant, 
they are going to reject that campaign and any associated campaigns with that brand that they're going to be looking at. So that's to the point number one. The other one, remind me of the, fir the first question again. It was in regards to um, this is if you're, I think you answered it. I think you oh, answered I remember the, the question now. This is if you have a bunch of employees that work for you. Mm -hmm. So, right. So let's just say I'm going to give you a common example. Um, I'm a plumbing company and I have tons of technicians. I have a hundred technicians and we give them, right. They each have cell phones, right. Do I need to get opt in from each of them? Uh, at all. So the answer is yes, you really do need to get opt-ins from them or say how you get the opt-in. Uh, it could be a situation where you own all the phones and give it to them. So you'll mark that in. Hey, uh, by them joining this company, we get opt-in verbally from all of our technicians here and they use our company phone. By the way, if you, they don't use a company phone, you still have to delineate how they're doing it. By signing up uh, to work for Roto-Rooter, they agree for Roto-Rooter to text message them on their cell phones. Um, that they own themselves, that maybe they subsidize the bill and don't pay for it, or they do. But as long as you're delineating how that is gathered, it is still required. Even if they're your own employees, you still have to say how they, um, that you've gathered opt-in from them. It's a good question though. Okay, awesome. Okay, well, we have gone over time now. If we didn't get to your question, you still have other questions that came up, reach out to us, please. You can, again, find us on our website, hit our contact page or just email us directly, team at tugrhythm.com. Additionally, we are working on additional resources for everyone because these questions are many, they are nuanced, there's so much going on and a lot of understanding that needs to happen still. So we are working on an A to P 10 DLC guidance ebook that will be coming soon. Anyone that schedules a demo with us this month will receive early access to this resource. So please ask us about that. Anything else from you guys? Yes. I'll say one more point. So first of all, thanks everyone for joining. Please reach out to us and our team. If you have any questions, uh, we're always looking to hear from people uh, and provide guidance in general. Uh, I'll say one final thing, which is going to probably come off as very skeptical right now, but we do make it our mission, um, if you know anything about our history, to kind of be on taps with uh, you know the, all the players in this ecosystem. And while over the summer, we understand that a lot of new rules have come out and they're very confusing, I could tell you that I will say as we end this year and go into the new year, what, you have, what you've seen come out up to this point is gonna remain pretty much, this is what it is. If anything, you'll see certain things recede. I don't foresee a lot of net new things coming. I know that everyone here looking at me probably really skeptical right now and valid reason, but I could say that literally over the summers where a lot of these cutoffs happen and kind of the final migration happen onto ATP Tennessee and the, the network operators and the ecosystem wanted to set the highest bar. And so this is like the highest of it. And now that they've kind of set that, we have found that they're beginning to ease up in certain areas. So what I would say is, especially if you're looking to streamline, a lot of the information we've given today and what we could share is pretty much what you're going to see for the time being. I don't expect a lot of things to change to become more aggressive. If anything, things will begin to ease up as we go into the next year. I know that you guys will wait for see action on that, uh, to hear about that. And so um, that is uh, my take on what we've seen of late here. So again, things have been a little bit uh, tough on this side, I would say uh, we should we shouldn't see things getting that much more aggressive uh, in in the near future here. But uh, that being said, thanks everyone for joining and thanks Zahid uh, for joining us as well. Of course. Awesome. Thank you both. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We will send the recording out when it's available.